Chapter 10, 1907. Adolescence has broken through the yoke of youth, replaced Alfred's last ever baby tooth, and given him a taste for exploration. So he climbs down from his favourite oak, skips through the smoggy smoke, and hops past this quiet train station. The year is 1907. A French engineer is piloting the first ever helicopter flight despite feeling nervous. An Italian entrepreneur is launching the first ever transatlantic wireless service. An American janitor is building the first ever electric vacuum cleaner. In the Isle of Man, a new motorbike race is speeding around. In Jamaica, a new earthquake is rocking the ground. And in America, a new air force is being launched by a man with a positive demeanour. Whilst the British accrue a chunk of Persia in return for their diplomacy, and agree to fight with Russia globally as they grow madder, mightier and meaner. But in shoes which shine like polished gold and which have just been resold, Alfred is unconcerned with such things. His ankles become muddy, his socks become cruddy and his blazer flats behind him like wings. He runs down these smoggy lanes, past these blocked drains, this rygoss, rosemary and rose. He turns and he twists with his bony ankles and bony wrists inside his old school clothes. He runs past this Bobby, Bundle Boy and Bookmaker, Usher, Umpire and Undertaker and this Bummery who has meat juice dripping down his back. He runs without fear, fueled by the free school lunches which began last year and a very sugary snack. Hey there, an impoverished voice calls from down that hidden track. I got me a copy of Boy's Own here if you want it. I read it already, you see. It's pretty Robin Hood. After likes of puzzles of various sorts, the various news reports and the various adventure stories which the Boy's Own newspaper contains. So without suspicion, scepticism or censure, he embarks on his own adventure by entering this alley which is full of black stains. He's just a kiddie, an anxious voice soon complains. Before his hand grabs Alfred's neck, throws him down onto this stony deck and begins to attack. It turns Alfred around, drags him over the stony ground and along the stony track, towards this divide which has bricks on either side, which are brittle, broken and black. See, he's got a scarf. This dominant assailant shouts back. And an Uncle Bert. We can make a nice weeping willow out of that. This boy's sooty clothes seem rather ragged. And his sooty face seems rather jagged. As his hands move about in a hurry. Whilst he grinds Alfred's face into this brick. As his feet begin to kick. Which make the squat assailant worry. The squat assailant worries about this violence. As he stands here in silence. Away from his partner in crime. Such that Alfred can only see that this boy is stumpy. Frumpy and covered in mucky grime. Have yourself a butcher's look at that, the dominant assailant starts to chime. He sticks his hand into Alfred's pocket, removes his dented locket, and kicks his pile of dirt. He begins to laugh, steals Alfred's scarf, Alfred's blazer, and Alfred's shirt. You can't just flee, the Scottish assailant begins to blurt. God knows this here boy will run after us. He'll shout very loudly, he will. People will hear. Ain't no safety in it. Ain't no safety in it at all. We'll have to break him some, he thinks. Yeah, the dominant assailant replies and cries with malice on his face and meanness in his eyes. Bit of an unscheduled beat, he should do the job. So he kicks Alfred's midriff, which makes Alfred groan. He stamps on Alfred's ankle bone and he drags Alfred over this uneven floor. He kicks Alfred's chin, which makes Alfred spin, before he kicks Alfred's chest once more. That'll stop him running too quick, the dominant assailant says with a roar. And this one will stop him making a box of toys. Now let's scap a flow before anyone sees. These are the last words Alfred hears before his assailant kick his ears, turn around and then leave. Before Alfred opens his battered eyes, rubs his battered thighs and rubs his battered sleeve. Whilst his face begins to ache, his body begins to shake and his pain begins to seethe. Without the strength to get to his feet, walk towards the street or breathe. And through the smog which cloaks his town, Alfred sees his priest in a long black gown who wears a snitty frown. <laughs> Help! Alfred shouts down. Been beaten! Please help me, sir! Please, 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 please! But his priest does not seem to be aware, he does not seem to care, and he does not stop to help. He leaves Alfred in pain as he begins to strain, yell, yowl, and yelp. And through the smog which cloaks the sky, Alfred sees this professional in a suit and bow tie with a monocle in one eye. <laughs> help! Alfred begins to cry. I've been beaten! Please help me, sir! Please, please, please! But this professional does not seem to be aware. He does not seem to care. And he does not stop to help. He leaves Alfred in pain as he begins to strain, yell, yowl and yelp. And through the smog which cloaks his town, Alfred sees this man in brown who looks a little bit spooky. 
His trousers are tucked into his boots. His hair is red at its roots, and his oily cape looks kooky. <laughs> Help! Alfie shouts as he becomes hazy, crazy, and loopy. I've been beaten! Please help me, sir! Please, please, please! The good German looks down this lane, where Alfred is wriggling in pain, near his pile of rubbish and that flooded drain. I'm at the end of the alley! He shouts out again. Please help me, sir! Please, please, please! The good German assesses the scene before he rubs Alfred's clean with his alcohol which starts to sting. Alfred wants to shout no, or go slow, but he does not say a single thing. Poor boy, the good German begins to sing. What a cruel world we live in today. The good German bandages Alfred's ankle with a piece of his shirt, removes his piece of dirt and carries Alfred to this inn. He calls the doctor to this room, fans that fire to reduce the gloom, wraps Alfred's arm in a sling. The good German sits on a wobbly stool and holds himself tall with a straight back and a pointy knee. He says that he works as a greengrocer here and moves somewhere near after he left his own country. I left my homeland some time ago, he says as he sips his tea. My father, you see, was a Mennonite priest, a man who prayed so hard for me to be born that it struck him down for weeks on end. Well, he'd been owed money by a layman, yeah? This layman, to escape his debt, had crept up behind my father when he was deep in prayer and slit his throat. My father lay slain on the cold stone floor, between the temple and the altar, with blood bubbling this way and that. As for me, I left on a mission to become a man of the world, to escape the pain of my father's murder, and to avoid conscription, which was being introduced into Germany at that time. I went through Syria, Iraq and Iran before I arrived in India. I visited their temples and conversed with their priests. I learned their stories, studied their animals and practiced their diets. Eventually, I found peace and set off for America with my fellow Mennonites. Only I fell in love with this part of the world en route and have remained here ever since. Well, dear Alfie, I like to think that my trip taught me a thing or two. Perhaps I'll tell you about it some day. It would save you a journey. Yeah. Good German's eyes are puffy with compassion. His hair is slightly ashen, and his face is slightly strong. Alfred gives him an easy glance, falls into a sleepy trance, and is snoring before too long. So the good German pays, gives Alfred a loving gaze, and smiles as he moves along. Take care of him, he says to his innkeeper, who is dressed in a shirt, a skirt, and a sarong. Whatever you spend beyond this, I will repay when I return. Alfred sleeps, snoozes and shakes before he rolls over and wakes when the morning eventually comes. When he rides his tram which is covered in wires with rubber tyres which are covered in rubber crumbs. From its window he sees his lavender lady with an exposed navel who carries her baby in a wicker cradle and sings My sweet lavender will help you to thrive. He sings his donkey who has a rickety heart who pulls a rickety cart whilst his orange man sings Five for a penny, just a penny for five. And he sees his gypsy's caravan near his organ grinder man who pulls his music machine whilst his monkey doffs her cap for coins, swings her apish loins and makes an apish scene. Alfred returns home where he passes his father's army wash rag, army bag and army paraphernalia. For like a cobweb mausoleum or a stuffy museum, this place is full of his father's regalia. Here is his father's sleigh, his father's beret and his father's gun, his flags, his tags, his medals and his drum. To the monks it all, Alfred's mother is full of fright because she's been whining about Alfred all night which has made her turn insane. But she brings Alfred some cocoa in a brown mug and a brown drug as soon as Alfred starts to explain. A little under a week, Alfred is just about able to talk and just about able to walk so he goes to look for a man who came to his salvation. He looks in valleys, he looks in alleys and he looks in this new fire station. He searches down roads with names like Leper's Lane. He sees names like Rotten Row time and again and he sees roads named sewer streets passes houses which stand to attention joined at their shoulders with concrete tension and joined at their concrete feet he passes the teachers who are riding their pedal bikes his handsome cabs which are full of spikes and his horse-drawn buses which all have wonky wheels these carts whose covers are starting to unravel these motor cars which are churning the gravel and these ladies who are wearing high heels 
before he stops outside this greengrocery in front of this pile of rosemary this awning which is lined with blue cables beneath which his tangerines and his curly beans are displayed on his outside tables. Hello Alfie, my dear boy, the good German says as he writes on his white price labels. He stands upright and holds himself tight dressed in an apron which keeps his clothes clean, which protect his suits and protect his boots which both have a glossy sheen. You are better, ya? Yeah? he asks in a voice which sounds serene. Yes, 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 Alfie replies in a voice which sounds keen. Thank you for asking. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're tremendous. You really are top drawer. My uh, 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 ankle is healing. My rib will mend given time. And I've even got a heart-shaped bruise on my chest. You're very brave, Alfie. I'm grateful to you, my dear boy. The good German replies. Not at all, sir, Alfred cries. I'm grateful to you. I was left for dead and you saved me. You're a hero, sir. You're a superstar. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. Nonsense, dear boy. Where I come from, helping those close to you is a duty, yeah? Much of a muchness, as I think you say. But helping a stranger is a privilege, a real honour, yeah? You've given me this great honour, and I'm thankful to you for it. Alfred starts to feel dazzled, flustered, flabbergasted, and frazzled. So he shakes his hairy head before a good German sits Alfred down, starts to frown and starts to turn dark red. Are you familiar with this story of the two dining rooms, Alfie? He asks with his arms outspread. This may help you, yeah? You see, there was once a brainy boy, a bit like you, dear Alfie. Well, one day he went for dinner in a restaurant with two dining rooms. In the first dining room, he saw rows of long tables which were covered with platters of sumptuous food. But the people at those tables were starving, emaciated and moaning. Their spoons were full, but their arms were set straight in splints. Yeah? No matter how hard they tried, those people could not bend their elbows, and so they were unable to feed themselves. The second dining room was also full of tables covered with platters of sumptuous food. But the people in there were content, talking, and full. Their arms were also set straight in splints. But instead of feeding themselves, they were feeding the person opposite them. And the person opposite them were feeding them back. Feeling excited, the Benny boy returned to the first dining room. Feed the person opposite you, he told the people in there. They'll feed you too. You'll all get to eat. And they all got to eat. Alfie finds this story so cool that he no longer climbs his favourite tree after school and visits a good German here instead. He arrives here today with his hair all astray on both sides of his overhead. I f f f found three juicy apples, sir, he says with cheeks which are ruby red. And I gave them to three strangers. I just wanted to be nice like the people in the second dining room. I wanted to be like you. But the first stranger refused to take her apple the second stranger threw his in the bin, and the third stranger just ignored me. Please, sir, d d d tell me what this means. I'd be ever so grateful. I'd be very much obliged. Why do you think there is a hidden message, dear child? The good German replies. This is real life, yeah? It's not a fable. It's not always a lesson to be learnt. Oh, thank you, Alfie says with dejection. Let me tell you a story. Dear Alfie, the good German says with affection, about a village which was struck by famine and drought. Yeah? The food had forgotten to grow there, and the rains had forgotten to fall. The villagers had no seeds to sow, nor any water either, until two brothers returned home after many months of work. The two old brother returned with seeds and water. Yeah? The villagers celebrated. They heaped praise upon that boy and planted his seeds in an open field which faced their village. But the short brother was modest. He told everyone that he'd invested the money which he'd earned. And so the villagers ignored that boy, like the three strangers ignored you. They even ignored him when he returned the seeds and water of his own. He had to plant those seeds himself. 
in a field which was hidden by the trees. Then came the rains. The skies opened and all the water that had forgotten to fall poured on down. Down onto the village, down onto the villagers and down onto the villagers' fields. Well, the field in which the tall brother's seeds were planted was open, proudly displaying itself to the village with no protection from the rain. So the water flooded that field and washed the tall brother's seeds away. But the field in which the short brother's seeds were planted was hidden away from the village. It was protected from the elements by the trees, yeah? And so the rains fed the seeds there, which produced enough food to feed the entire village. The villagers were elated, but they had no one to thank, because the short brother had remained silent, yeah? And so they celebrated together and heaped each other with praise. The near the carrots, cabbages and courgettes on the slanted table. Alfred likes his fable, which he thinks he understands. He thinks he understands all his mentor's tales, which he listens to whilst he chews his nails and waves his childish hands. I get it, he says, as he hops past his potatoes, tomatoes and cans. I get it, I get it, I get it. It doesn't matter how others respond to the good you do, or if they abuse, ignore or mistreat you. It's enough that you do good. Yes, yes, yes. That's just it. So Alfred is inspired by the good German's fables, folk tales and facts, compassionate acts and passionate zeal. He's inspired to perform good deeds for people with needs and for people who have a raw deal. He helps paupers with limited wealth and paupers with limited health almost every single day. And to the old Alfred of Sunday school crushes and primary school head rushes completely fades away. He writes some jokes for the dejected, some compliments for the disaffected and some proverbs for the morose. He puts them into pockets, packets and purses and gives them to nannies, navvies and nurses, while ever started to boast. He hides them in books, and he hangs them on hooks, while ever getting caught, despite coming close. Which brings him to these woods on this balmy afternoon, where Bernie is climbing trees like a wobbly baboon, who is clearly in his element. Though his shoulders which are too wide for his chest, and a waist which is too wide for his vest, he does look a little inelegant. In Grey's tree, Alfred and Bernie, friends forever, ABC, before he rolls up both of his sleeves. Before they stop to speak, play hide and seek, and throw these autumn leaves. Before they blow into pine needles, catch some beetles, and play cops and thieves. Alfred climbs this majestic willow and finds his metal trap, in which his pieces of leather strap divide two separate compartments. One contains berries, which entice birds in, whilst the other contains twelve birds who are thin, and pressed against his metal vents. Alfred sets eleven birds free, and watches them flee, whilst they sing, shriek, and squeal. But this poorly thing, has a broken wing, and so Alfred wants to help her heal. You can't do that, Bernie begins to appeal. Oh, rum, have you gone mad? Bonkers, doolally, cuckoo. Those birds belong to the trapper. Good God, man, what earth do you think you're playing at? But, but these but, but, but birds were born free before they were caught, Alfred replies, which means they belong to nature, not the trapper. Please understand, please, please, please. Not really, no, not at all, Bernie argues. Things change. Hunters eat the animals they catch, fishermen keep their catch, and nations rule over the lands they conquer. It's precisely the same thing. Stuff only belongs to nature before men take it. Alfred pauses to think, takes a swig of his drink, and turns pale pink. Bernie, he says with a wink, you'll always be number one in my book. But please understand, if friends live side by side, and enemies live apart. Rabbits live with worms but flee from foxes, robins live with sparrows but fly from cats. And those live with mice but hide from hawks. Well, whoever owns this trap is this bird's enemy, because he meant this bird harm. This bird should have to live with him. But I wish to heal her, which makes me her friend. So she should come and live with me. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, thank you, you. Bernie can only shrug, sneeze and sigh, because he is unable to reply or respond. So he talks about comics with histrionics while they walk around this pond. Before Alfred walks back to his family home on his own, and gets mud all over his boots, whilst he looks at these shops which sell fishing tackles, metal shackles, and frilly bathing suits. And this cafe, which is full of colourful dust, colourful rust, and colourful fruits. He gazes into this drapery, which is full of colourful fabric, colourful plastic, and colourful dye, before he sees his fishmonger, when his buddy starts to hunger, and his eyes begin to spy. He spies on the fillets, which are getting smoked inside, the fishes, which are getting fried, and this alley, which is hidden next door where he finds scraps, slivers and skins, 
in these big blue bins and in the crates which cover this floor. Alpha sneaks behind his pretty promenade and skips from yard to yard on top of his yellow brick walls. He sneaks past his shops which sell lemonade, sheets of suede and bags of bouncy balls. Before he spies Miss Bakery which is full of rice cake stuffed with berries, shortbread topped with cherries and bread made from sourdough. Where he finds cross cookies and crumbs inside these wooden drums which are arranged in a wonky row. He finds food outside factories which have machines, schools which have canteens and the homes of the wealthy. And amongst the scraps, coarse crumbs and caps, he finds some food which is actually healthy. He finds pies, puddings and potatoes, tuna trout and tomatoes, beef, bacon and brisket, lentils, lettuce and lamb, seeds, swedes and spam, beans, broccoli and biscuit. Before he finds this orphanage which is made of collapsing walls, crumbling halls, creaking doors and cracking windows. He is rendered tender-hearted with pity for these orphans who are just so gritty, with gritty fingers and gritty toes. They sit on these gritty stairs and in these gritty chairs, wearing their gritty clothes. They are wearing shirts which need to be mended, and trousers which are far from splendid, with bare arms and bare feet. Some of them are hawking, some of them are talking, and others are sweeping the street. This malnourished child lies in a gutter. This maimed child lies behind a shutter and this teenager lies beneath a tree. Alfred feels a connection, so he feels with loving affection and passionate loyalty. He sneaks in through his building's back door, tiptoes down this corridor, and slinks into his pantry which looks like a shed. Its shelves are completely bare, apart from two fishes just there, and five loaves of stale bread. Please can I b b b b b borrow your trolley, sir? Alfred asks for a good German tonight, while he stands by this light and shakes his hairy head. Please, please, please. The good German is slightly confused, slightly bemused, and slightly amused. Why? He asks and laughs because he is slightly intrigued. Well, sir, Alfred replies and sighs because he is slightly fatigued. I'd be uh, uh, happy to tell you, but please tell me, have you heard the story of the two brothers about how it's better to do good than it is to talk about doing good? The good German chuckles, clicks two of his knuckles, and agrees before Alfred pushes his trolley with childish folly and springy knees. He pushes it to the fishmonger in a hurry and he begins to scurry as he heads to the baker's in a buoyant mood. He takes his fish heads and fish fins and all the bread in his bins as he fills his trolley with food. Before he sneaks inside this orphanage with nervous trepidation and a fear of damnation which builds as he enters his pantry where his heart begins to thump and his knees begin to bump as he fills this empty gantry. He fills it until his bread covers every inch of his store, his fish covers every inch of his floor, and there is food on all of his racks. So that where there is just a stack of dishes, five loaves and two fishes, there is food piled up in stacks. Alfred leaves and hides behind this car, which allows him to spy from afar, as his orphans sit down on his peat. As they kneel, marvel at their meal, praise the heavens and begin to eat. Alfred walks off beneath these smoggy skies, for he returns each week with new supplies, which he finds all around this town. He returns with vegetables which are green, meat which is lean, and tuna which is brown, with berries from the vine, pots of brine, and fruit which has fallen down. He starts to find the good German's trolley full of berries, carrots, courgettes and cherries, peppers, pumpkins and peas. Perhaps it is because the good German likes what he hears with his ears, or because he likes what he sees. He would not be the first person to spot Alfred as he sneaks around without a sound before he finally flees. Get back here, you besperched little scoundrel! The fishmonger often starts to wheeze. I see what you've been a doing, a fiddling with my fish! And the chef who eats more food than he serves also fills Alfred with nerves and also lets him go. Perhaps he turns a blind eye, or perhaps he prefers not to pry. Alfred does not know. But neither this fishmonger with his noisy screaming, nor this chubby chef with his busy scheming, can curb Alfred's taste for mischief. He continues for a hundred weeks and all, and brings 5,000 meals down this crumbling hall, which brings these orphans relief. He also carries bags for every pregnant lady he meets, helps old dears across the streets, and helps people with diseases. He helps people in this poor neighbourhood with deeds which are good, whatever he pleases. It's here that he approaches this daughter who is covered in greasy mud, spurting blood and purple bumps. She is similar age to Alfred, with freckles on her head and her hair in tangled clumps. She sits with her mum who seems to be stressed, Panic, petrified and possessed, and in distress. As her wig falls over her face, these strips of purple lace, and this tatty purple dress. W w w what has happened? Alfred asks, because he is unable to guess. This, the daughter says as she wipes away this blood 
this mud and this mess. Oh, I am sorry. I didn't mean to make you worry. It's just that I've been bleeding for 12 hours now. I can't afford a doctor. I'm ever so poor, and no one will help me. I'm ever so sorry. I haven't offended you, have I? Oh, whatever should I do? Whatever should I do? As he listens, Alfred realises that he had once bled like his daughter, and pled like his daughter, before a good German had saved him when no one else would. So he spots an opportunity to serve his community, to do the same, and truly come good. The good German had put Alfred's arm in a sling, tied his ankle with pieces of string, and banded him with his own shirt. So Alfred uses the fringe of his cloak to stem the daughter's bleeding, and finds himself succeeding, as he reduces her torturous hurts. The good German had taken Alfred to an inn, wiped Alfred's chin, and carried Alfred in his own arms. So Alfred carries his daughter, gives her some water, and comforts her with his charms. And the good German had taken Alfred to a hotel room, banned a fire to illuminate the gloom, and paid for a doctor with his own money. So Alfred takes the daughter to his pharmacist, who can assist, and pays for a coagulant to stop her blood from staying so runny. His involvement helps the childish Alfred, who is plagued by Sunday school crushes and primary school head rushes, to evolve into a man. Matured by the adult company, which being a single child brings, the presence of his father's things, and the good German. He continues his random act of kindness without suspension, and involves himself in too many to mention, which totally evolves his behaviour. It's not care for tradition, custom, culture or condition, or any sort of convention. He does not hold a grudge, judge or act with any pretension. Without getting distracted, he becomes proactive and pays very close attention. He continues to learn, acts with concern and real comprehension.